Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hmm? I'm on. Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Oh, you will? Thanks. Christmas is the most- Hey guys, Philomena Kunk. I love her, so we're just- we're watching a Philomena Kunk video. It wasn't recommended. I can choose every now and then. Magical time of- Hope you guys are doing well. Did I say the things? My name's Connor. If you're new, hi. I like to watch- Stuff. Riveting, I know. Exciting. It's Philomena Kunk. All right. Original links. Where they are. Discord. Where it is. Would love to have you. Makes it easier for me to interact with you. See your recommendations. Let's watch. Christmas is the most magical time of the year. The one day when you can eat chocolate, nuts, and sprouts and watch television. Apart from all the other days, you can do that. Whether you're a Christian or a Jew, a Muslim or a Hindu, a Jedi or a Womble, Christmas is everywhere. On television, in the high street, even in normally sacred places like churches. Christmas is such a big deal that even Richard Dawkins probably does it. And he thinks God's a twat who isn't even there. But what is Christmas anyway? Do we still need it in 2016? No. I'm going on a journey right up Christmas. Yeah, I said something. Christmas, most overrated. Uh, Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday, okay? Maybe 4th of July after that. I like Halloween. But Christmas, I hate giving and getting presents, okay? I don't like it. Don't like it. I just, if it were up to me, the presents, except if you're a kid, obviously. That's a huge part of being a kid. On Christmas, getting presents. But as soon as you're an adult, just just don't get me any. I just please. Um, and well, that that's about it. If you just get rid of that, I guess it's a lot better. To discover whether the true meaning of Christmas has any meaning today, or whether that meaning snapped off somewhere along the way, leaving it meaningless. Whatever that means. I'll be talking to experts about every single Christmas that's ever happened as well as finding out where Christmas traditions and giant tubes of Jaffa cakes come from. How do they make chickens yeah. into turkeys? Turkey and chicken are two separate birds. He's adorable. You're joking me? No. So join me, Philomena Conk, as I step into Christmas and back out again. Didn't I wait to react to this for Christmas? It's close enough. All right. I have the Christmas tree. Christmas. I have to move it. I have to. Uh, it's got to be in frame. Right. Not gonna happen. Sorry. There you go. Now it's Christmas. Is it just tinsel and a long Doctor Who? It's a festival with traditions stretching back across hundreds of years and almost as many Christmases. It's hard to imagine now, but when Christmas first began, Christ wasn't even in it. Psycho Danny Dyer hasn't always been in EastEnders, even though he feels like part of the furniture, especially when he's trying to act. Centuries before Jesus arrived, uh, my squad of people who can help me understand jokes I don't understand. Please, please, please. Late December was already a time of celebration for the pagans, who existed so long ago there aren't any YouTubes of them. So we've had to make do with this picture. To find out what the pagans were, I spoke to an expert. Were there they hydrated. pagans before they were humans? No, you've got to be a human to do anything. 
Pagans are just people who lived in Europe before Christianity arrived. How difficult was it for the pagans to get about on all fours? They didn't travel on all fours, they travelled upright like we do. The pagans worshipped nature, just like Chris Packham. And their calendar revolved around two big annual events, also like um, Chris Packham. One of these events took place in late December was and was known as the Winter Solstices. What was the Winter Solstice? It's the Winter Solstice. Sol solstice. It, solstice. 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 You got it. It's that magical time, midwinter and midsummer, when the sun seems to stand still. <laughs> to the eye, it appears to stop moving along the horizon. Well, you're not meant to look at it, are you? Because it uh, hurts your eyes. You can look at it when it rises, and you can look at it when it sets. Then you can. No, it's you often... can't. It makes you go blind. You can. Believe, trust you me, can't. you can't. That's probably why you've got glasses. As well as blinding themselves, the pagans... I'm being really annoying. I'm sorry, guys, but... Isn't it true that... That's the spring and autumn ones. ...celebrated the solstice by cutting down holly and ivy and dragging it into their homes, along with a giant yule log which they'd set fire to. It sounds rubbish, but with no app store to speak of, killing trees and plants was as good as entertainment got, even at Christmas. Of course, for most people, it wasn't really Christmas until the birth of Jesus Christ, an icon who was almost as revered back then as Beyonce is today. Jesus' mum was this woman, the Virgin Mary, who one night got visited by an angel and told she'd been gotten pregnant by a holy ghost. Of course... Likely story. Oh! Uh, I don't know how it happened. Actual ghost is ectoplasm, oh, which God. only contains ghost sperm. Jesus Christ. But Jesus wasn't born a phantom, leading experts to believe Mary wasn't impregnated by a real ghost, but by a man in a sheet, like in Scooby-Doo. Mary's husband Joseph didn't mind his son being God's rather than his, because he knew God had probably buy Jesus loads of toys and have him on weekends, which would take the pressure off. As the birth neared, Mary and Joseph travelled to a little town of Bethlehem, only to discover the inn they'd booked had no rooms in it, so instead they were put up in a stable. Today that had lead to one red star on TripAdvisor. Back then, it led to one big star in the sky, which God put there, probably so they could see the baby coming out. Murray had to give birth here on the floor, like a crack addict, and then lay him in a manger. Manger is another word for trough, and it's where we get the name for modern sandwich chain, ready to trough. The baby Jesus wasn't an ordinary baby. He was born with a big yellow circle round his head, which must have been hell for Mary to push out, especially when you think nothing had ever been in or out of her down below before. If only he had been born a ghost after all. Lies. Then he could have just floated out, clanking chains and going woo. Why do you think it's important? I to... need to shut up. I'm sorry. I have too much energy and I'm talking a lot and I know it's annoying. Doubt, clanking chains and going woo. Why do you think it's important that Jesus was born? Would it have been more interesting if he'd have been built like R2-D2? No fear. <laughs> It would have been more interesting, but the important thing is that he can identify with us and he was a real human being. That makes him more sort of relatable. I yes, suppose. very much so. But then if he's, he's meant to be like an ordinary bloke and he wanted to come across as an ordinary bloke, how come he had all like angels and kings at his stable on his birthday? Well, that was a bit weird, wasn't it? Mm. Although, of course, I would want to say that angels are around all the time. Um, you don't don't necessarily see them there and then, really? but sometimes you catch a glimpse of something out of the corner of your eye, or maybe you smell a, a nice fragrance. Vanilla. Maybe. How many three wise men were there? Who knows? Oh. And I think only one of the gospels refers to there being three. But it's just three is a good number. Isn't yeah. It? I love her voice. It's so soothing. I don't believe in anything. I am very boring when it comes to that stuff. I have no beliefs. Zero zip. Don't believe in anything. That's just how it is. And I love how 
I said I wouldn't pause. How they're all serious, even when asked the questions. One of the Gospels refers to there being three. But it's just three is a good number. Isn't yeah. It? it looks good. So, but there could have actually been 15 three wise men. Quite possibly, yes. It's humbling to think that Jesus started out with nothing, but not in a palace, but in a stable. Just the ordinary son of an ordinary woman and an ordinary man and God Almighty. Incredibly, the day he was born was only the beginning of Jesus' life. Imagine, like, you're the guy who knows, like, you were the one to cheat with Mary, to cheat, cheat with Mary on Joseph, and how relieved and then pumped you must have been when that excuse worked. And it's like, I'm God. You know? Because you know we just escaped out the window or something. As a young man, he kept a yeah. low profile in the wood industry. But when he was about 30, his career took off. He went on to appear in a number of thrilling and controversial paintings, windows and films. Today, Christ lives in the hearts of millions of believers, but still spends Sundays here in his dad's house. So let's go and see if he's in. No one was in, as usual. Probably because the church Wi-Fi isn't as good as Starbucks, but standing in this old creaky building gives you a real sense of history. Thanks to Jesus' popularity, huh? Christmas was celebrated for hundreds of years. Celebrated by people who were buried long ago, but are still alive in the form of drawings of themselves, some dating back as far as the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, did they know it was the Middle Ages, or did they just think, this is now. You know, how did they know that they were halfway through time? They thought this is now, and they thought they're incredibly advanced. This is the greatest moment that society would reach to. It'd be amazing, wouldn't it, to get someone, get a Tudor back that we could resuscitate, yes. cryogenically or something. Yes. And then show him what had happened since he died. It would blow his mind, wouldn't it? It would. The internet. The internet. The internet. Google. Cars. Aeroplanes. Fitbit watches. Fitbits. One thing our time traveler would. Jokes aside, that's one of the most awesome, fascinating things ever. That I think is so easy to forget. Everyone in, in the in the in the in the present thinks they're the main character of civilization. And it's so so so. I although that she was joking around there, fill me up. But th like, did they know? Uh, like that's such an awesome thought. Just knowing that, like, we are going to be hundreds of years ago to people in hundreds of years. That sounds so stupid and obvious, but that's so awesome. Um, that, that, that just thinking about, like, everyone that, like, they were, like, all, like, look at all the inventions we have now and what, look, think about what they had, like, only a hundred years ago in, in the 900s. And I think that's so easy to forget. So uh, jokes aside, that's such a awesome thought. Would recognize Fitbit watches. Fitbits. One thing our time traveler would recognize is the tradition of getting drunk and acting up at Christmas, which back then was known as wassailing. So what was wassailing? Is that like a sort of a bit like bants now? What's, what's bants? Bants. bants? It's like when someone's acting like a prick. Oh, really? What it is, is basically a group of people, usually a group of men, go around from house to house with a big bowl of drink and they knock on your door and they sing songs and the idea is that you're going to swap a drink from their bowl for a gift. So it was a bit like trick-or-treating then, was it? It was very like trick-or-treating. I mean, what sort of costumes would they do? Because they were already sort of covered in shit, weren't they, with, like, slugs on them and mud and everything. They didn't usually wear costumes. But it was also a way of creating community cohesion, going from house to house. It was something that was supposed to be fun as well. So that's really the very early beginnings of going from house to house singing carols. Because the history lady said that, we've now cut to this. Some boys singing carols in a church on earth. Thanks. 
How do you get the, the music into the words? Like how do you attach the music to the words in your throat? Well, you tend to attach the words to the music instead. Is you attach the words to the music yeah. as it's coming up through your throat. So does it feel like, where does the music come from? Does it feel like it's coming from your stomach, like you're going to be sick, but it's like nice well, sick? Kind of, I guess. Not all Christmas songs are quite so religious. In the 1970s, groups like Slade reinvented the carol, appearing on our TV screens, showcasing a new form of singing called shouting. Guys, is it true they would, you know, snip, snip, some boys back in the like the Middle Ages when they wanted uh they called a falsetto. Uh, 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 like so that like they could sing like super high pitched. Is that true? Like snip snip. This music that was sucks. loud, probably to keep Jimmy Savile away. For years, having a Christmas God. number one was the ultimate music industry badge of honour, right up there with choking to death on your own sick. More recently, songs released from glossy TV shows like X Factor took over the Christmas number one slot. What's clever is that these songs have got absolutely no Christmas in them whatsoever, probably because if Simon Cowell touches anything to do with Christ, he catches fire. Meanwhile, back in the past, by the time the Tudor era arrived and the music all sounded like what you're hearing now, Christmas had become an excuse for gastronomic indulgence. Tudor feasts were huge and often included roast goose or swan or peacock, basically a big bird roasted whole. That might sound traumatic, but in the days before television, they didn't know big birds have a person inside. To find out more about Tudor eating habits, I spoke to food expert Jay Rayner. So what sort of things... Uh... He's a genius. I don't even think that leg hitting the table was an accident. I just think she did. So I spoke to... And my favorite ever is just... <clears throat> Who are you? <laughs> the food expert Jay Rayner. So what sort of things... Uh, Valium? Did... Tudor people eat at Christmas. They had things like peacock, didn't they? What goes with peacock? What kind of grave? There, there is evidence that they ate, you know, very exotic things, but only the, the, that would have been the very, very richest people. I suppose the best thing about them as well is that tail, and that's not going to taste of anything, is it? No, that's purely for display. Mm. Yeah. A Tudor Christmas, then, they'd have peacock, like you say. No, I think like you said. The royals had peacock. I don't know how much peacock was eaten in Tudor days, I'll be honest. How did that affect their bowels, you know, what comes out of their back holes? I don't know. I suppose if they were eating too much, it would have caused certain bowel issues. I suppose meat, lots of meats. Lots of meat Com can... Compacted together. Can compact, yes. And they sort of big, hard stools. It would have been uncomfortable. Fibre. I imagine, but I'm only guessing. Let's see, that would have been the first bit that I'd gone to if I was a food expert. Just when our ancestors were getting well into Christmas indulgence, history shut out someone who was allergic to fun. Oliver Cromwell, King of the Puritans. Cromwell was a member of Parliament who wouldn't wear smart clothes and never smiled. A bit like Jeremy Corbyn. And just like Corbyn, he wanted to change the country. Ooh. But instead of sitting down on a train, he got off his arse and did something about it by starting a civil war. Civil war is like a real war, but not abroad, so it's cheaper. And that meant ordinary people could start one, not just kings. The English civil war divided the country down the middle, like a sort of tooled up Brexit. Cromwell won and cut the king's head off, which meant he couldn't be king anymore, even if everyone changed their minds. Now the British public had taken back control. No longer did they have to do whatever the king said. Instead, they were free to do whatever Cromwell said. It turned out Cromwell hated all the things kings like, like feasting and burping and music and throwing chicken legs over his shoulder and laughing. And that was just the tip of the turnip, because in 1647, Cromwell banned Christmas. What? According to the Puritans, Christians shouldn't celebrate Christmas because it's not in the Bible. Instead, they should be inside a church, which isn't in the Bible. Christmas isn't in the Bible, huh?
I need to read the Bible one day, like just as a book, you know, not as like a, I love to read, you know, Quran, Bhagavad Gita. What is that that they that those that that those Hindu Krishna? Just the religious books would be cool to read, just because they're such historically important. According to the Puritans, Christians shouldn't celebrate Christmas because it's not in the Bible. Instead, they should be inside a church, which isn't in the Bible. Reading the Bible, which isn't in the Bible. The ban on Christmas continued until after Cromwell's death. But by 1660, we'd found a new king up a tree. The new king even had a head, although it looked a bit like it belonged to Boise of Only Fools and Horses. And now the monarch was back and the Puritans had buggered off. Christmas was free to become more festive and less religious. For years, Jesus H. Christmas was the number one face of the festive period, very much the Captain Bird's Eye of Christmas Day. But his rule over his mighty tinsel kingdom was to be threatened by this man, Father Christmas, Damn street it. named Santa Claus. Like Jesus, Father Christmas is used as a bribe to make children behave. Although in his case, the prize isn't eternal salvation, but presents. No wonder the moment Santa came on the scene, it was game over for Jesus. He had to accept a lower ranking job in the global icon industry. So where did Santa come from? If you think in the North Pole, that's because your parents lied to you. Ooh. He actually stepped out of the pages of history. Where did Father Christmas come from? Well, Father Christmas comes from St. Nicholas, and he is a 4th century Greek saint and bishop, Dad. and he was very renowned for giving presents to the poor, and particularly... 14th century Greek... ...saint and bishop comes from St. Nicholas, and he is a 4th century Greek saint and bishop, and he was very renowned for giving presents to the poor, and particularly he gave presents to these three girls. If he hadn't given them the money, they would have had to go off and be prostitutes. So why was he knocking about with these prostitutes? I don't think he knew them very well. It's just that they... Well, well enough to give them gifts. Give them money. I don't, I don't think... I, I think he just wanted to save them mm. from the horrors of... I think because well, basically... They all say that, don't they? They do. How come <laughs> shops have Father Christmases, but they don't have Jesuses? Is Jesus's the right term? Is it Jesus I or I think we'd say figures of Jesus. Yes. Figures of Jesus. I think that Father Christmas himself would probably have preferred there to be figures of Jesus, because in fact there is a medieval story. Saint Nicholas got in a punch up about whether or not God or Jesus was greater and was thrown into prison. So he was obviously very exercised about the purity of religion. It's all coming out, isn't ah, it? I thought the whole thing is that he's his son or so he was obviously very exercised about the purity of religion. It's all coming out, isn't it? You know, because like, I didn't know that he used to hang about with prostitutes or get into fights. Now I'm feeling less happy with him coming down my chimney. Despite being the stuff of nightmares, ah. Santa is the world's most popular home intruder. Probably because, unlike other home intruders, he doesn't leave a turd on your living room carpet, but a pile of gifts. Santa has a list of good and bad children. The uh. good children gifts. What? Santa has a list of good and bad children. The good children will get lots of presents. And so it turns out, well, the bad children. In fact, the only ones who won't get very much poor are the kids. poor children. Yep. <laughs> That's because Santa... Yep. Santa likes rich kids more. Obviously, they get more presents, kids. The judges a child's goodness based largely on parental income. The sense of magical wonder on... It's so true. It's, it's so sad. A child's face largely on parental income. The sense of magical wonder on a child's face as they open their presents, which allegedly makes Christmas worthwhile, can last for up to 10 seconds. That's why for many, Christmas is synonymous with little ones. Adults lose the ability to see Father Christmas. So if you want to know more about him, you have to ask small adults, which are known as children. Hello, who are you? I'm Archie, <laughs> who are you? Philomena. Have you ever met Father Christmas? I have. Where did you meet him? I met him um, um, next to Westfield. What was he doing there? Was he shopping or something? I think, I'm not 
quite sure if Father Christmas is rich. Mm, I don't think he is. How did he get all the presents in, like, lots of times? Wave like, labor. I think he just shoplifts. Okay. Do you think Father Christmas has ever met Batman? In what? my opinion, Batman's not real. In my opinion, Batman's not real. It's just, it's just a man called, called Bruce. So you don't think they've met? I think Superman and Father Christmas have met. Do you think that Father Christmas will still be allowed in the country after Brexit? Yeah, he'll still be allowed in the country. Will he? Yeah, because the police don't know when he's in the air. Like David Bowie, yeah, Santa experimented with many different looks, finally settling on the familiar Fat Jolly Laughing Man look in the late 1800s. The Queen Victorians were batshit for Christmas. Oh my God, guys, okay. I know, don't tell me if you freaking tell me in the comments. Connor, well, yeah, the Victorian era was filled with horrible uh, poverty and, and, and gross, you know, the factories and, and bad things and weird medical. I know, don't ruin my happy feeling. I love the Christmas carols, every one of them. The Muppets Christmas Carol, the Michael Caine Christmas Carol. The uh, Jim Carrey animated Christmas Carol, love it. Kind of gives creep me out a little bit. Um, I love, like, my, my most happy image. One of my happiest just images in my head is an 1800s. It's just look at, look at, look at any of the Christmas Carols uh, movies. Um, or, wait. Like, um... Like streets, like Victorian building streets with like snow on the ground and lightly snowing, and on the rooftops, and then you have the jolly little kids sweeping the chimneys. Maybe not jolly. Don't ruin my image. Just everyone's happy in my image. Tiny Tim dies. Spoiler. Does he die? I forget. I just, I love it. I have such a romantic view of that time period. It makes you so cozy. Just the, the streets of Victorian era London with a, with a blanket of snow and a tr snow and like a, a horse carriage going down cobbled streets and people singing their Christmas songs and Scrooge. It just, I'm getting tingly all over right now. Not in that way, in the sexual. I'm pop. I just love it. 1800s. Oh my the god, I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch it. I'm gonna watch a Christmas Carol after this. Yeah, fat jolly laughing man look in the late 1800s. The Queen Victorians were batshit for Christmas and popularized many of the traditions we still do for no good reason today. For instance, Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, did what his fellow Germans had been doing for years and had a tree installed in his lounge. I'm Albert's tree would remain the most heavily decorated piece of wood to grace Buckingham Palace until the day Roger Moore was knighted. The Christmas tree is still the centerpiece of most festive decorations. It's covered in lights, chocolates and baubles, which is what circles are called at Christmas. There are also these characteristic vines from the most festive plant on earth, tinsel. Tinsel became a decoration because you can't do anything else with it. It's horrible in salads and won't boil down for soup. For years, the best Christmas decoration was the Blue Peter Advent Crown, which took a load of coat hangers and tinsel and cleverly transformed them into a load of tinsel round some coat hangers. Now no, you'll see how it. it all fixed together. Today, some people choose to turn the outside of their homes into a giant advent crown. A jolly house covered in electric lights may be expensive and use a lot of power, but it's the perfect way to cheer up a world worried about climate change and dwindling resources. Of course, in Queen Victorian times... Yeah, the... I'd never do that. Just too much work, electricity. Maybe like one thing with lights. Is there one of the things I would never do, but I'm I'm glad there are people that love to do it. So like, cause I can look at them. The super rich had fancying resources. Of course, in Queen Victorian times, only the super rich had fancy decorations. Ordinary poor people had to celebrate Christmas by coughing and counting their surviving offspring. 
Life in Queen Victorian Stop. times You're was ruining hard. my image. The streets were full of urchins and rippers, and there was so much poverty that people used to go to prison just to get some bread. But there was one man who cared. The greatest Prime Minister Britain ever had, Sir Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens wanted people to be generous to those in greater need, like the poor, the homeless, or the dead. So he wrote something called A Christmas Carol. Thank you, Charles Dickens. You are one of my favorite people in history now, just history, just because you gave us this. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord Dickens. Amen. Which was something called a book. As seen in this powerful and evocative adaptation, A Christmas Carol is about Ebenezer Scrooge, a character almost as fully realized as Disney's superior Scrooge McDuck. Unlike Scrooge McDuck, he's human. And unlike most humans, he hates Christmas. But then, in a terrifying development, he starts getting visited by ghosts. Like his house is built on some sort of Indian burial ground. The ghosts take him forward and backwards in time to see different Christmases. Like that thing on Facebook that shows you old haircuts and people you don't talk to anymore. One ghost shows him the future, but it's only by a year, so it's still a Victorian future. As it is, he sees a future in which everyone's delighted he's dead. This convinces him that Christmas is actually brilliant, which to be honest, the ghost could have done by giving him a chocolate orange. Nobody can argue with that. After the Victorian era, goodwill to all men caught on so much that it was almost 12 whole years before everyone on the planet decided to kill each other in the mud. Although it What's that called? The uh, Cenotaph? Christmas Truce? Uh, soccer game? It was scheduled to I almost said football game. You, I'm turning British. Jesus. Caught myself. Years before everyone on the planet decided to kill each other in the mud. Although it was scheduled oh. to be over by Christmas, the war with Germany lasted four years. Mechanized conflict is the most horrifying legacy of the 20th century, as anyone who's seen Robot Wars will agree. But at Christmas 1914, there was a brief ceasefire. The fighting stopped. Soldiers got out of their holes and joined together in a place called No Man's Land, That's so showing awesome. that even at moments of peace, Men will still divide into two sides and try to beat one another. The Great War. Well, only if they have a similar culture and both celebrated Christmas. I, I doubt if it was like Japan versus Britain. Like I want to come out. Claimed over seven. Will still divide into two sides and try to beat one another. The Great War claimed over 17 million lives, making it the worst incident of football-related violence of all time. After the First World War, Christmas spirit once again reigned supreme until the Second World War. We don't know if Christmas happened during Second War II because there simply aren't any records. But there's no footage of Hitler or Churchill in Santa hats either, so it's safe to assume it was parked while they twatted each other. Once Hitler had defeated the Nazis by blowing his own brains out, <laughs> Christmas returned with a bang, and a second period of food-loving indulgence dawned. And... 50s got some of the greatest Christmas music of the all time. The modern Christmas dinner soon became an important cultural cornerstone of both society and gravy adverts. Mum made the gravy. Could you talk me through what makes a perfect Christmas dinner? Once you've got the right people around the table, yeah. um, you need a light starter. If you, if you give people too much to, which is not really... Not prawn cocktails. Not a, well, I don't know. If you, a, a good prawn cocktail's a lovely thing. Yeah, I love shrimp cocktails. I don't like prawns. Do you not? No, they're bottom feeders. Okay, I tend to do platters of charcuterie, salami and ham and maybe some pickles and things for people to pick up. Yeah. You wouldn't no. have that? No. no? Okay. Charcuterie? And then we come to the main event. So maybe a three-bird roast or a roast goose. Uh, Christmas bread ham. sauce gravy. But I don't understand bread sauce. It's a great way of uh, making a really savoury sauce. Bread and sauce are two completely different things, aren't they? Well, they are, but you can you can grind the bread down and then cook it in milk to make a really good a really good sauce. It just looks like sort of you? cheese. <laughs> <sighs> Thanks to all this food based. They're such good sports, the historian. <sighs> What did it look like? A really good sauce. It just looks like sort of cheese. <sighs> <laughs>
Thanks to all this food-based indulgence, scientists now believe that 80% of all burps occur at Christmas, threatening to put a hole in the Oswan layer at precisely the moment the sky is full of vulnerable reindeer. Eating aside, the other popular form of Christmas indulgence is gift buying from yeah, shops. Like get rid of it. Critics say Christmas is too commercialised and that the Bible has been replaced by the Argos catalogue. Just that, that's not why I hate it. I just don't like giving or receiving presents. I just, it seems like something that you, you just want to do to make your... Uh, because it's commercialised and that the Bible has been replaced by the Argos catalogue just because it's got a better selection of hair straighteners. Recently, Christmas shopping has started to look less like a supermarket sweep Christmas special and more like a civil war with carrier bags. No wonder more people than ever stay indoors shopping on the computer. So is Christmas all just about buying stuff these days? How much money gets made at Christmas? Altogether, I'm sure we spend hundreds of millions of pounds at Christmas. And how big a cut does the church get? The church doesn't get anything. In they the don't get but I thought, sorry. Christmas. And how big a cut does the church get? The church doesn't get anything. In they the don't get anything? No, no. The supermarket near me has got about 30 tills. How many tills does Amazon have? They must have loads. They don't have any tills. What? They have a computer. One computer? Yeah, because no one goes there, do they? They just do I know, but they, I thought they'd still have to ring it through. Mm. No, the computer does all that. So there's one man at a computer just going? No, I don't think there's a man. No, no, it just goes automatically. You do that. You're the till. He's Making money is so important at Christmas that shops pull out all the stops to fill the screens with jolly images of buying things. And their adverts have evolved from cheerful animated catalogues full of famous people smiling at you to heartwarming present-day mini-movies about infested trampolines. Us through the box. Adverts aren't the only programs on at Christmas. There are also programs on at Christmas. For decades, Christmas television has been an enchanting place, a magical land where people danced and sang in a doomed attempt to convey the sheer magic of Christmas. A time in which newsreaders cavorted with comedians and real live snowmen were gathered from the wild and encouraged to sing their haunting traditional songs in the studio. But perhaps the most reassuring Christmas program is EastEnders, which for years has provided an important public service by depicting worse families having an even shitter time than yours. I've never seen this. are a mainstay at Christmas. And one familiar film is the searing musical The Sound of Music, which is about a woman who sings to hills about hills in the hills. The hills are alive with the sound Look at that grass. Music. It's great... always on at Christmas, probably because it's got nuns in it, so you think about Jesus. And also Nazis, mm. so you think Important about The part. Great Escape, which is probably on on Boxing Day. But the most Christmassy film of all time is also the most exciting, Die Hard. People think Die Hard is a gripping and exciting action film just because, as you can see, it is. But it's also a heartwarming yuletide story full of the magic of Christmas. It's got everything, singing. A man up a chimney, warming yourself in front of a roaring fire while the snow flutters down outside. Brotherly love. Hey, look, I love you. So do a lot of the other guys. Cranberry sauce, excessive sherry drinking. God, that man looks really pissed. Season's greetings. Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. Your dad conked out in a chair, wearing a Santa hat and his Christmas jumper. Angels majestically soaring through the air. And of course, Alan Jesus Rickman. Christ Powell. Jesus Christ Powell? TV's becoming a thing of the old and past, like sundials or plows. Because today, everyone has their own little screen, so they can ignore their immediate surroundings on an individual basis, instead of as part of a collective effort. 
We're often told to feel sorry for those who are alone at Christmas. But these days, that's all of us, and it's brilliant. Best of all, this kind of technology is set to become more immersive than ever. For instance, this man from the year 2018 is enjoying a virtual Christmas with a family of characters from the Nintendo universe. Jesus, that's dark. Meanwhile, this man is experiencing the true meaning of Christmas by giving birth to a virtual baby Jesus in a stable made of polygons. I thought he was, I thought he was gonna say, guys, the future of VR, porn, okay? You're gonna make so much money, all right? That's gonna be the future, okay? Whoever gets on that is gonna be filthy rich. Today, the true meaning of Christmas is a mystery, wrapped up in sherry and monopoly and monkey nuts. But at least at this time of togetherness and warmth, we can all agree what the true spirit of Christmas is. Baileys. Merry Christmas and a very new year. Follow the trials and traumas of middle-class motherhood in our new comedy, Motherland. No! Press the red button to watch the entire series, available on BBC iPlayer now. My immersion! Next on BBC Two, Dara and Ed's Road. <laughs> Probably gonna get me copyrighted anyway. Cheers. That was really amazing. Um, I love Christmas time, but I hate the presents. Get rid of the presents, except for kids, okay? Obviously. Except for, for kids. If you're, un, like, uh, even, like, teenagers, you know, if, I, uh, if you're not an adult, I'm not saying, but, like, from, from parents to children, I think that, that like, I, that, I, I will never forget that. My, my childhood, so happy. Um, maybe just because I'm super introvert. And let me get this straight. It's not that I only just don't like getting presents. I don't like receiving them because it just seems like, Like, a, like, if a present was sincere, I feel like it would happen on, like, a random day. But it's like, oh, it's Christmas. I gotta buy a present. Here you go. Like, nine out of ten chance is gonna be like, a oh, man. <gasps> yes, thank you. Oh, my God. Here's one for me. I'm so Maybe I'm just weird and just boring and a Grinch. Scrooge. I'm fine with being a Scrooge. I love that movie. Love you guys. Hope you're all doing well. Have a happy Christmas in uh, in a month and and six days. Uh, love y'all. I'll, I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Hilarious as always.